So we're going to start now the beginning of the, of the sessions. We're going to start with our round table. I want to bring back to what it is, kind of our main uh, introductory uh, uh, session for today. So we are going to be bringing in a panel that is going to be led by Dave Nevin and is going to have representative uh, Nancy Nathanson, uh, Rakesh Bubba, uh, Reza Rajay, and Margaret Pan from uh, different members uh, of the constituent group that really work hard at working through partnerships and talking to each other to talk about the journey of the Oregon House Bill 2049, uh, which created the Oregon Cybersecurity, uh, Oregon Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. So with that in mind, I would like to welcome our panelists to the podium, please. And let's, let's hear a conversation here. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just welcome everybody to this uh, session. And I just want to start by saying that we started this panel with uh, four participants and the panelists a few weeks ago. Yesterday, we lost one of the panelists to COVID. This morning, uh, we lost our moderator to an illness. And uh, our last panelist is coming from Corvallis. And our replaced moderator is also on the way. Yes. And that's here we are, the, the remaining ones. We'll see whether we make it. Here we go. They're, they're coming here in. are the last one so, coming in. Yay. They were just late to let, give me time to tell you about this story. So. And I, ho I hope you won't mind, but our audience has been patient waiting oh, so for us. Go I, I'm going to start with a few opening remarks while you get yourselves squared away. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Nathanson. I'm an elected member of the Oregon State Legislature. And I've been working in this space for some years. I see a few faces in the audience that I recognize. Some of you uh, are new to me. Uh, but I am not new to the topic of cybersecurity. And you're all probably wondering, what's a politician doing up there talking about cybersecurity? I'm not only a politician. That's what you all uh, would probably call someone like me. I'm also a policy wonk. I also worked in the field of uh, data management and information science. In fact, I worked on the University of Oregon campus for over 30 years, uh, 35 maybe <laughs> and counting. So I've been working in this area and aware of issues. I, I want to tell you that uh, from my point of view, yes, I'm a lay person, but I'm here to support what you all do to advocate and to push. And we pushed really hard together and accomplished something very cool. Um, so uh, IT, all that stuff that sounds so cool, the internet of things, right, AI, all of it sounds so, school, so cool. Well, it gives me the creeps. It really does. It gives me the creeps, and I'm really scared of all of it. I was just telling someone a few minutes ago that it really bothers me thinking about my smartphone and smartphones that you all have and smartphones that someone's grandmother and someone's grandson have. Uh, they're all walking around with smartphones attached to everything from washing machines and refrigerators to light bulbs and televisions at home. And every one of those places can be a point of weakness, right? And it just scares the poo-hoo out of me when I think of what, what all uh, it, it, everybody has access to. So all this societal investment, humongous investment in creative infrastructure, if you will, that has given the biggest, best target to bad actors. The target is everywhere, everyone, all the time. It's ubiquitous. And that's what the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence for the state of Oregon, we're going to hope, will accomplish. Um, I chair a committee. Uh, it's called the Joint Legislative Committee on Information Management and Technology. It's a mouthful. We call it the IT committee. Uh, a few years ago, I redirected our work from basically receiving boring reports of state agency investments and updates to their computers. 
I didn't want to just be rubber stamping reports, and we got to be an activist committee, and boy, did we get active. Um, the number and nature of attacks was exploding. Let me tell you how I see it, and uh, you all, I, I want you to recognize how much of this is important to all of you, no matter where you work, it's where you live. Think about the schools, the libraries. Oregon has 36 counties, more than 200 cities, 1,000 special districts, 19 education service districts, and 197 separate school districts. They're all delivering services and overseeing critical infrastructure. They have their own data secure, but they're all talking to state agencies and county agencies. They're talking with each other, and that's where the vulnerabilities come in. The smaller organizations can't fund their own cybersecurity staff, and it, that's exactly why we uh, we have pushed for this vision of the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. It's all hands on deck. It's designed to offer, through growing collaborations among governments and all, all of those entities I just explained, the vision is to close the workforce gap, provide direct services, and elevate awareness and information. I think it's over to the moderator now. All right. Has everyone caught their breath after arriving? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much Thank for your presentation. I think this is on. Yes, it is. Hi. Hi. So I am not Charlie Kawasaki. I'm Dave Neven. Uh, Charlie was taken ill last night, had to return to Portland, uh, and uh, Barol is also absent uh, today. So uh, you get a substitute moderator in an empty chair. So sorry about that. Uh, Charlie was kind enough to share notes with me about what he was planning to cover on the moderator. And he included a couple links to how to moderate a pro, moderate a panel like a pro. And I didn't get a chance to watch that, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. Dave, we have a representative from PSU to we fill, it, fill I, in for. I'm going to know, introduce them. Great. Okay. It's all taken care of. Uh, thank you. I, I just have to read 35 pages here. <laughs> all right. So we'll start by introducing uh, Professor Reza Roger. Raise your hand. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, who has a fancy U of O lanyon, lanyard? I mean, yeah. The rest of us just have green, so I think that means something. Uh, he's professor and head of computer science department here at uh, U of O, and he has more than 25 years of experience in several areas of networking, such as internet measurement and cybersecurity. Uh, he is a fellow of IEEE and a distinguished member of the ACM, and he is an associate director of the Oregon Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, or I'll refer to as OCCOE from here on. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Boba is an associate professor in the School of EECS at Oregon State with 15 plus years of experience in cybersecurity research and education and is co-founder and co-lead for ORTSOC and has been instrumental in the development of the CCOE. Uh, professor Margaret Banyan uh, is a research professor with the Center for Public Service at PSU, and she is responsible for the Mark O. Hatfield Cybersecurity and Cyber Defense Policy Center Cybersecurity Resilience Certificate. That's a mouthful. Uh, and led the PSU team to formalize the establishment of the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And you've met Representative Nancy Nathanson, uh, who serves at House District 13, which includes North Eugene's Harlow, Cal Young, Northeast Neighbors, Good Pasture, River Road, and Santa Clara Neighborhoods. So sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yes, does that work better? Yeah, I stay close. I can get really close. All right. Uh, she is co-chair of the Joint Committee on the Information Management and Technology, as she said earlier, with Senator Woods and has been a consistent and leading champion for addressing cybersecurity issues and is the sponsor for House Bill 2049, which established the center. All right, so we have some. Yay to all of us. We all did it. Audience interaction section. So raise your hand if you're associated with the educational sector. Oh, that's a big number. Uh, associated with state or local government. Okay. Associated with the private sector. Cool. 
Good. All right. Good. Uh, associated with critical infrastructures such as utilities, healthcare, et cetera. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Wow. All right. And please raise your hands if you've been involved in any capacity in the CCOE House Bill 2049 uh, that passed this summer. Actually, I'd like to have you stand. And we'll also give you a round of applause. All right. Who thinks the state needs to do more to secure everybody in Oregon? This is an applause thing. <laughs> All, right. All right. Who thinks the state has underfunded these efforts to date? And that's a please boo. Boo. <laughs> Okay, I know it's early, but come on. <laughs> okay. All right. So the goals for the panel discussion. Um, we would like to inspire you to all get involved, and we'd like you to leave with an understanding of what the CCOE can do for you, how getting involved in the development and execution of the CCOE benefits you, either personally, professionally, or for your organization. I thought I was going to get in trouble for a mic issue again, but no. Okay. Um, how you can get involved and support the mission and what each panelist contributes to the CCOE so you know who to contact for what. All right. So we'll start with Representative Nathanson. What inspires you to champion cybersecurity solutions at the state level? And can you describe the key elements of House Bill 2049? And what specifically about House Bill 2049 are you most excited about and why? I think everyone heard earlier how, uh, how worried and concerned I am and what inspired me to be involved. Uh, let me uh, be very brief now. The vision was always to close the workforce gap in one of the hearings we had more than two years ago, we were already short over 7,000 cybersecurity jobs in Oregon alone. There's a website that, it's not like I track it every day, but occasionally I go refer to it, and there were consistently over 7,000 cybersecurity jobs uh, needing to be filled for Oregon. Uh, that was problem number one. Uh, problem number two is it, the expertise just wasn't out there. It's like. Uh, services and programs were being disrupted. People were dropping like flies in a way. It, it was uh, very alarming, but who was there to help? No one was there to help, so I knew it was going to take a whole of government approach, and I no longer wanted to talk about just helping state agencies. I wanted to talk about helping Oregon, not just Oregon departments, but helping Oregon because it's about our economy, it's about our society, and it's about our community. So I, I wanted to see a whole of government approach, not talk only about state agencies. I also knew that we needed to embrace the private sector as well as all sorts of nonprofit organizations, uh, local and state government as well. So when I uh, became aware of what was happening at Oregon State University, Portland State University, I asked what was going on at the U of O, uh, I realized we had a moment in time, maybe the stars would align with the situation, the circumstances, and the willing personalities. We have now created something that is precedent setting in the state of Oregon. I want to make sure you understand how important this is. This is the first time in the state's history, and I've, asked, I've been asking a number of people, we believe it's the first time in the state's history when the three largest universities in the state have joined together to collaborate and do something uh, together as a program for the whole state. That's an amazing accomplishment. Thank you all. That's an amazing accomplishment. I really like the idea that I learned first uh, out of the words of uh, someone who's not with us today, uh, the idea of a teaching hospital model, which is where students learn. It, it's as if a classroom now is taken to the community. It's like a teaching hospital, 
They learn in the classroom, but they're going to be, they already are, providing direct services to organizations or entities that can't provide those services for themselves. I just loved that analogy, and uh, we, we just took it forward to build it into this massive bill that's many pages long that talks about a cybersecurity center of excellence for training, for workforce development, deliver services directly to local governments, school districts, uh, uh, the water district, like we had a water district uh, uh, that was a victim of an attack uh, during our legislative session, a, a utility district, schools, one city, one county, you know about Curry County, all of the, there were a number of attacks where services and programs were down for days, Curry County, it was three weeks, I think, totally down. That small list, that's only what we know of publicly. And that's what happened only during a four months of a legislative session. So that's why this Cybersecurity Center of Excellence is going to be critical. Thank you, Representative Nathanson. Uh, I'm going to skip the formal titles for the rest of the panel uh, because I don't know their last names. So Margaret, <laughs> can you uh, please describe the CCOE in terms of its mission and goals, and why is PSU a great place to house it? Am I on? Just you are on. Now talk am I again. On? Yeah, turn the mic towards your screen. Now am I on? How about that? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am also not Beryl Yesalata, uh, so but I am standing in. So, so one of the things I want to share is just to take a step back in the development of the OCCOE, which is this effort started uh, prior to 2017, 2015. And there was a lot of thinking throughout the state. So a predecessor before me really uh, helped facilitate some of the research work going throughout the state talking with entities throughout state and local governments, private sector, individuals, uh, universities. So it was a pretty massive effort to really identify what the OCCOE should do and what it should be. I came along late in 2018, 2017, 2018, like drinking from a fire hose, like uh, perhaps many of you, about what were these acronyms we were talking about. Uh, and it, it took me a, f a few months to catch up, but uh, we were able to support, Portland State was able to support the, um, the Oregon uh, Cybersecurity Advisory Committee. Committee? Yes. Advisory Council. Yeah. Advisory Council. See, I still don't know all the acronyms. Uh, and, and, and part of that effort, I think, really came out with some of the initial vision for OCCOE. And as things have, have changed and developed, one of the things that uh, I want to share a little bit about is the, the mission here. And the, the mission currently is around awareness, education, and training. And so, of, again, this is uh, like Representative Nathanson talked about, a very collaborative approach, which is really important to cybersecurity in the state. So awareness, education, and training throughout multiple efforts. Uh, also workforce development was one of the real critical needs that was identified that we have talked about. And that includes higher education, community colleges, STEM programs. And then finally, there's a, a component around research that's really critical. And that research is both in educational research, but also in technology. So there's a, a mission and a goal for research development and technology. Uh, and then finally, goods and services to, to, to governments and to special districts and to provide some of the support uh, for uh, the, the real critical needs throughout the state. And we'll talk a, I'll talk a little bit more about what that, some of those things have meant. Uh, but do you want, want to add anything in terms of if I kind of missed anything? Well, I think ad yeah, advising is another element. Advising, providing expert mm -hmm. advice to legislature, to governor, to all those public bodies is yeah. another goal. I don't know if it's... Yeah, and one of the, the things I want to add, going back to the history of this, is, you know, the 
the, uh, 2017 SB90, 2017 was you know one of the predecessor bills um, that tried to establish a center of excellence. Um, but I think the legislature said we'll stand up the council, make a more solid plan for the for the center, and come back. And then sort of it took us multiple iterations. So as Margaret pointed out, it started in 2015, and PSU was one of the the research team at the Public Policy Institute Hatfield Center was the one supporting, um, collecting initial data on how this center should look like. And that's, and that's one of the reasons you know, PSU is, is housing this, because they have this public policy angle, which is unique and very important for cybersecurity. Yeah. All right. So we'll go back to Rakesh oh. uh, on this one. Uh, can you describe the current state of the center, what challenges you have in establish, establishing it, and the hiring plan? And what's the first set of objectives and outcomes for 2024? Um, yeah, that's um, th this is this has been consuming since the 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 law passed um, right um, in the summer. So we've had a very short ramp uh, to get the center um, up and running. So the bill becomes effective October 1st. So which is which we are we are we are there now. So in terms of what the current status is, I think each of the universities have identified the leads who would, who would be leading, who would be sort of um, contributing to the uh, organization of the center. And the three universities are working. One of the requirements um, is that the center needs to develop a, a, an operating agreement between the universities because it's a joint center um, hosted at PSU, operated by the three. So we're sort of going through those mechanics with, with the... Um, university Council working on the operating agreement and the charter, so that's sort of in the works, and uh, we actually will have a meeting again um, sometime this week or next to finalize that. So that's the mechanics. Until those things are um, in place, um, the, the funding doesn't start flowing until those, um, those happen. The other aspect um, that we're working on is this center also has an advisory body, and the idea is that you know, there's a broad um, stakeholders, both Representative Nathanson and, and Margaret covered um, in terms of who um, we are established to serve. And this advisory body is sort of, um, is our, you know, um, voice of the customer, so to speak, to sort of um, guide the needs and sort of inform the leadership. So we are in the process of setting up uh, that advisory body. It'll actually be an appointment um, through the governor's office. So we're sort of... Um, I've identified candidates, and many of them have been, uh, I think, approved. So we will we will be launching that. So some of the mechanics of this is, you know, just getting the charter done, the agreement done, getting the advisory body up, so that we can we can get up and running. Because until the organization is formally in place, the leaders leadership cannot be appointed. Um, they've introduced uh, Reza as one of the leaders, but I think you know this becomes official once the center is up and running. Uh, in terms of the agenda for the first year, uh, a big part, I mean, although we've collected a lot of information, and one of the things that I've been amazed over since 2015 is the amount of support and how many stakeholders involved and sustained. And so we've gotten, um, you know, some of the center is conceived with, with voices of all these stakeholders, but still, we want to sort of expand that and, and sort of go around the state and, and hear the concerns and the problems of the stakeholders that we are set up to serve. So that's one big thing for us. The, and the most important things is to, to, ho to have these hearing sessions, build a community. Because, you know, we want to raise awareness, we want to provide services, but more importantly, we want to create a community that can work together to solve our problems, right? I mean, that's number one for us. Uh, the second um, important agenda item for us is workforce development. And, you know, a big advantage for the center being, um, you know, operated by uh, educational institutions is that we already have a lot of workforce development efforts underway, and this center will allow us to coordinate, focus, yeah, and integrate these efforts. So that's, uh, that's a big one. Uh, we are already um, starting to provide services directly, and that, that's with the funding from the center we'll be able to expand. So in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here and then as things come up uh, we can we can dive in yeah all right so it's back to you Rakesh <laughs> uh, 
can you describe the programs at OSU that are most directly involved in the CCOE and what they aim to accomplish? And in particular, talk about Ort SOC and the Northwest Cyber Camp. Yeah, so one of the things um, is, you know, because the center is starting, we're gonna focus on existing um, programs and that's what um, Dave is asking me to do, but I wanna sort of make it clear this is not the end all of the of the center, right? And and although the center is starting with the three universities, uh, there's a lot of higher educational um, institutions that were involved in helping set this center up. So the goal is to sort of um, coordinate and integrate those programs too. But today we'll kind of focus um, on on the programs that that are happening. And I want to acknowledge that there are other good programs around the state as well, right? That that's what I'm trying to do. So the two things that um, the center directly supports that uh, activities that are happening at um, OSU. Uh, one is called the OTSOC, um, and actually Dave, uh, one of the reasons he's stepping in as the moderator because he's already scheduled to be here. Um, he has a talk, 10.30, Dave, or 11 maybe, um, 10.30, uh, in one of the tracks, talking about OTSOC, and, and this is the teaching hospital that Representative Nathanson is talking about. And the idea of this is, that students in their final year of undergrad right now, and we have a master's program coming up soon, they actually provide uh, concrete security services to underserved organizations. So we're thinking things like network security monitoring, um, uh, risk assessments, and eventually um, maybe, uh, right now we do some remote response, but eventually res incident response and so on. So this is, for those people who are not, I'm assuming this, this audience already knows these terms, but basically monitoring networks for intrusions and, and sort of responding to them when they detect. And the idea for this is our final year students are providing the services, but under professional guidance. And this is similar to a wet hospital or a, or a medical hospital where there are interns or residents sort of providing services under the guidance of experienced doctors. And the students get really hands-on um, experience that they're ready to join the workforce. The second effort, and this is, it used to be just, you know, OSU and a few other entities, but the Northwest Cyber Camps, uh, these were uh, started by our moderator, to, um, Charlie Kawasaki, in 2016. We joined in 2018, uh, I mean OSU, but now it includes um, University of Oregon, it includes uh, Portland State, and actually um, uh, PCC, and we, we have um, Chemekka coming up next year. So there's a whole bunch of uh, folks joining this effort. And this summer camp is uh, meant to inspire uh, high school students into cybersecurity careers. So this is a week-long um, summer camp that we've been doing it. And a highlight of this summer camp, actually, that I haven't seen done in other places is that uh, we usually have three, four sites around the state. Um, you know, Portland, Gresham, you know, Oregon. We also had once in Bend, and this year in in Eugene. Uh, we bring them during that week uh, to a central location, typically in Portland. This year we did it in Portland Community College. In the past, we used to do it in Mentor Graphics Campus. We bring all the students from the camps together for an evening networking and reception. And I know some of you uh, here participated in those and and supported those, especially the. Uh, industry folks, and this is an evening where we bring people from around the state showcasing cybersecurity education programs. Companies come to talk about internship opportunities. This is to try and get students early into cybersecurity careers, and some of those students ended up uh, in our program. Uh, one of them is pursuing a master's in policy in Georgetown now. Another one is pursuing a PhD at OSU in security for AI. So. Um, we are seeing the benefits of those 2016 efforts. Those are high school students then, and now they're in grad, grad programs now. And I'd like to point out that uh, the moderator he spoke of was Charlie Kawasaki and not me there. So. Yeah, 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 I, I, I did mention. And, and as Reza pointed out, this year, with the generous support of the donors, the community, you know, Technology Association of Oregon helps us organize the networking event, the, the camps were free. Um, in the past, we charged because, you know, we were all volunteer effort. This year, the camps were free, and for next year, three of the sides um, were able to get NSA uh, funding to run these camps. So uh, we were able to sort of multiply the uh, funding that came through the Oregon uh, Center of Excellence and sort of, um, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, add on federal funding to it. All right. Uh 
Reza, can you uh, describe U of O's contribution to the center and the programs you're establishing under House Bill 2049 funding? So one of the activities that we have been engaged in for the past uh, year and a half that was aligned with the workforce development goal of the center as we were working with our partners to establish the center was um, a new bachelor's degree in cybersecurity. So this is now approved and starting this fall we are offering this new degree. It is at its core a computer science degree that emphasizes many aspects of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so this is meant to address the workforce training goal that we have been talking about a lot. I just want to use this opportunity to mention that a big component of this degree is experiential learning. And we particularly require students to spend one or two term um, at a company getting engaged, with, getting engaged with a set of activities related to cybersecurity. So for that, as we are ramping up the size of this program, we are... Um, looking for partners. We already have a number of partners, but we're looking at those companies who want to have these students as intern for a term or two. This gives you a chance to work with them, get a preview of them as an employee, and perhaps down the line hire them. And it also gives a student a chance to be in a working environment uh, in the wild, so to speak, and uh, get uh, experience uh, in action. So. So this is one of the main contribution that we have had already and going forward we're gonna expand on. Um, should we talk about the plan day for this, this biennium or Dave, do you wanna know about the plan for this biennium as well or this is coming later? Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's gonna be the next question. So okay. Might as well go. Okay, so, um, so as Rakesh alluded to, this is a start of the center. So there are a lot of logistical issues that we are taking on, and we hope to make them quick, but <laughs> they are anything but quick. So we are taking a lot of those issues. Um, as we are looking at this biennium, some of the obvious goals that we have uh, promised to work on. Um, at U of O, we are working on a master's degree in cybersecurity. We are sort of exploring what type of program it should be, uh, what is the right target audience, are we looking at professionals or are we looking at the students who go spend a, an extended peri uh, period of time in industry. So we are working on a new master's degree just in cybersecurity. We are also looking into the possibility of offering a certificate program. So this is a post back program for people who have a Bachelor of Science and now realize that, hey, cybersecurity is a better field for me and they want to take a few courses and get into this field and uh, contribute. So we're also working on that one. Um, we are really interested to work on pathways between community colleges to the university. One of the challenges is that the students go to community colleges interested in cybersecurity, but the type of courses that they take doesn't really set them up to join a bachelor's degree if they come to university. So we want to coordinate and work with community colleges to see how we could line this up. So transition for these students uh, from community colleges to the university is smoother. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the other issues like the research and all that later. So we get okay. go around. All right, thank you. All right. So Representative Nathanson. I dare say all of us believe the initial funding under House Bill 2049 is entirely insufficient to make the level of improvement in cyber resilience we are hoping for. How do you see this process working out to grow these programs and more using state support? So some of you might have realized that was a very uh, diplomatically worded message about you didn't fund us adequately. <laughs> and I readily acknowledge that. Here's some sort of behind the scenes information that I don't, it, 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 people don't realize it and I'm just gonna let you know. When I walked in to provide testimony at the final Ways and Means hearing in support of this bill, arguing why we had to do it and we had to fund it, 
I had no idea that somehow overnight, in, in the late hours of the previous day, the funding had been cut by two thirds. I had no idea. We had a budget that we knew was solid, it was adequate, it was enough to fund what these three universities had said, yes, we're willing to collaborate, we're gonna do it. Uh, and then, as was mentioned, it will spread out and include Southern Oregon, OIT, community colleges, it, you know, it, it, it would eventually spread throughout higher ed. I had no idea the funding had been cut. Um, first, I want to say I'm extremely grateful to the universities for their cooperative spirit and can-do spirit, which is, we're going to do it anyway. It's a, it's, it's a foot in the door. You have to get it started. In a way, it's like proof of concept. You prove what you're accomplishing, and then you come back and ask for the remaining funding or the next level of funding. So first of all, I got to say, it, it, you can tell I've always been interested in this kind of stuff. I've always worked on how to make government more efficient and more effective, two really different things. Efficient uh, means are you producing things at the least cost possible? Effective, are you producing the right things? Are you teaching the right things? Are you providing the right services? So in being interested in all of that, it, I have also, in these many years of working in the legislature, it's easy for a legislature to fund something that their constituents can see. They can see a flagpole, they can see a park, they can see a school, they can see a new uh, wastewater treatment plant even. You can't see cybersecurity. It's easy to fund things that are tangible. It's not so easy to fund the backroom stuff, right? Uh, but you have to have it. So one of, one of the things I was thinking about came up just last night. If we can have a public policy that we spend 1% of project money, capital construction, 1% for art, can we have a percent we spend on cybersecurity? It's infrastructure, it, it's essential. Uh, there are some things that uh, I could recommend, though, to get real specific. Uh, first of all, the universities and the community colleges, not just these three, but all, all of higher ed, including the community colleges, they could be sharing with their boards, with their students, with their supporters, how this cybersecurity center of excellence is something that they want to participate in, they need, they need to be communicating that to their legislators, whoever represents them, the representatives and senators throughout the state of Oregon. So that's one thing. We also need to make the case uh, for the center to the relevant state agencies and local governments, how the center is critical. When I think of all the different shared services, I'm going to uh, look at my notes. I had a couple of um, really fun examples for you. Some of you know this, some of you maybe don't. Um, we have so many places where local agencies are connecting continuously with state agencies, uh, se uh, accessing records for fingerprint checks for people applying for jobs, working with children or vulnerable seniors or working in the financial community. Schools sending data to the Department of Education. Municipal governments are depositing funds with the state treasurer uh, and sending information to the homeless inf information system at Housing and Community Services. Department of Justice works with county district attorneys on child support payments. Payments. Secretary of State is managing voter registration systems. All these systems are connected, sending data back and forth. We need to be making the case with state agencies why they need to care about the center because the center is protecting all of these touch points, all these potential vulnerabilities. So I think we need to build the case with state agencies and there are one or two people in the audience I know who understand the bureaucracy uh, of a state government and funding through whether it's federal or state government. You make the case to build it into a state agency budget. It gets recommended then to the governor. That, that work starts next spring and summer. The state agencies build their budgets. We need to convince them to build some support for this into their own budgets and have it work up to be part of a governor's recommended budget. That's really behind the scenes, but I think it's, it, it, we need to make that effort. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Okay. 
I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so we uh, save time for questions. And so back to Representative Nathanson. Uh, from your perspective as an elected official, can you characterize the benefits either personally, professionally, or on behalf of their organization that the attendees of this conf conference would receive by working with you, the CCOE, and the working group organized by Sean McSpadden? Uh, oh, the, the benefits of working on this and with the center, well, some people are going to think immediately to, it's a bullet point on a resume. I want to convince everyone that it's so much more than that. It's so critical. This is about connection with community. What it does for me and how I like to inspire people, and I love talking with the high school students, community college and university students who come to my office and inspire them. It's always about something bigger than just me. It's, it's not just about the cool latest technology that you carry around with you on your phone or through an earbud or something. It really is about connecting community. Uh, it, it, to me, there's something much more longer lasting than, okay, you got the double shot of espresso with the chocolate coffee, or you went to the concert movie, or you went to the hot yoga class. Those, those are all things that bring immediate gratification. They're really cool. In a society like ours, we're a first world nation. We have many benefits, but think about all the people in our community who can't afford those things and all the vulnerabilities and what happens when Curry County can't deliver services for three weeks. What happens when a school, Los Angeles school district was closed, how many days? A few, uh, more than 100,000 students couldn't attend school because of what happened in LA. When I think of the work that we need to do here and the center is going to be part of the glue that brings it together, it's really about our service to society. And that's what I hope will, will inspire everybody. It's what inspires me. All right. Uh, Rakesh, same question. Yeah, one, um, thanks, Dave. Thanks, to Nathanson. I think that's, that's a great way they put it. One of the things that I, I look at, I think one of, the, one of the first things that Representative Nathanson said is about um, gaps, right? Um, we, the technology is involved in everything we do today, and with that comes um, cybersecurity risks, but we don't have enough um, people working uh, to protect us against that. So that's one, uh, one key aspect, and it's you know, pretty much a big thing on our mind. The other thing um, I see is uh, raising awareness and, and attracting more people into this field. And if I go, and I won't name, name the places, but I've, I've, I've been to other um, states um, that have been embarked on a, on a path uh, you, you know, like this earlier, um, so they're kind of further along. Um, maybe some of you might be, how many of you are aware of cybersecurity competitions? Okay, may, many of you. So, um, so there are national competitions, you know, national um, um, cyber league or um, you know, cyber defense competitions and such. And I've seen in some states, uh, in order to inspire uh, people to take part in these things and actually create a community that's you know getting better at this, they have local cups even before they can go to the you know nationals. Uh, in one um, city in the south, they have a mayor's cup. So the teams actually compete for the mayor's cup, and the mayor, I think, offers them, and I think the local universities offer scholarships for students winning that cup, and that's how they, they create the, the environment for these students to get inspired, and then they can be very successful at the national level. And, you know, this OCCE is, is kind of an opportunity for us to sort of galvanize and I think, you know, how do we get? The local governments don't have to be passive recipient of services, right? Uh, they, can, they can cultivate uh, this enthusiasm for this field. Um, and I, I just did my first lecture for the term yesterday on, on you know, I, I do the introductory class. And one of the key things that we talk about is not everybody needs to be a cybersecurity expert, but everybody needs to develop a security mindset, right? So I think... Oh. I, I think that's, 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 part of, that's part of our awareness goal. And it's not something one center can do. It's a community thing, right? So we are hoping that um, our, our communities, our school districts, our um, uh, 
private sector partners can help uh, be a part of this thing so we can bring more people because cybersecurity is not going to go away because any new technology you come up with, it's going to have cybersecurity challenges. Now, AI is everywhere, right? And we know there is going to be a lot of cybersecurity challenges with AI and, and machine learning, and we are seeing them already, and this is only going to increase. So um, one of my um, things is that Cybersecurity is definitely required for all computer science students, but I want to sort of broaden that and say engineering. That's what I used to say when I joined the profession here in OSU eight years ago. Now I would say it's a, it should be mandatory for all, all undergraduate education, but we, we should start at the school level raising awareness about this topic. So I'm hoping we cannot do this without community support, and, and you know this is what we can do for our community. All right, uh, Reza, same question. What was the question? It was a while ago. Okay, I will. Uh, I think. How about uh, I use the one that's written down here then? Sure. Okay. So for your new programs, can you also describe the benefits you intend to deliver to third parties getting involved? Okay, great. So um, let me let me start this uh, my answer by the following uh, inspiration that got us uh, got me excited about this center. I mean, as, as a professor at U of O and any other university, we are teaching our courses, we are doing research, we uh, sometimes have collaboration with external parties that is exciting. You know, we have a solution, we work with an ISP, and then we interact with them to see how what we develop is, is used in practice. But this center and involvement of us in this center essentially opens the door for us to interact with the stakeholders from a school district to the governor's office and everything in between. So the fact that we can interact with such a wide set of audiences regarding a topic that is foundational, affects them on a day-to-day -day basis, is, is a, has a societal impact that as an academic, I don't know how else I can do it. So that's an excitement for me to be involved in case you're wondering. Otherwise, I have my day job, I didn't need to do this, but this is exciting. Now, back to the question. Um, we have, just to give you an example of such an impact, we have developed um, a cutting edge solution for uh, networks, in-network security detection and network management that is not available out there for ISPs and companies to go out and buy. This, it is scalable, it is agile, it's future-proof. So this is an example of something that we have developed, it's mature, we already deployed at a couple of networks out there, it is deployed at the edge of campus today. I hope it's okay that I'm sharing this. And uh, because of that, we are able to identify attacks and problems that otherwise they cannot identify. So I'm reaching out now and tell you as a member of center or in whichever capacity you like to consider this, if you're interested in such a partnership to have this mature, stable, uh, cutting edge solution deployed at your network or at the edge of your organization, reach out to me, we'll talk, and this is one of the ways that we think uh, this advanced solution can be deployed and can be kind of spread into the society and finally having an impact. Did I answer the right question? I'm you answered some questions. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, Margaret, uh, same question, and can you provide an example of benefits some of your prior and existing critical infrastructure programs have pro provided to people like the ones in the room today? Thank you. So, so I, I just want to provide, is this working? Okay. I just want to provide a couple examples of some of the work that Portland State has been doing. So one is a, a, a pretty large research project on critical infrastructure and developing a, a roadmap, specifically a ransomware technology, uh, readiness technology roadmap. It's also a mouthful. There's there's more to that title. Uh, but one of the things that, that some of the preliminary research is coming out and showing is in terms of gaps. So uh, the panelists here have mentioned gaps. And so there's technology gaps, and, and that's something I think we're all pretty aware of. And there's other gaps, too, that the roadmap has identified in terms of the relationship between the work that we're doing. And what I mean by that is gaps between sectors. So 
private sector, talking to the public sector, talking to the nonprofit sector. Uh, and so information sharing is still continues to be some of the gaps that the technology roadmap is identifying. In addition to that, some of the relationship between the physical, uh, physical security and uh, cyber security. So there continues to be gaps in that area. Uh, and so in terms of the work, uh, the application of that, some of the, the intent for Portland State is to identify the gaps and develop training around what's next and training for specifically for the uh, cybersecurity community writ large, right? Not just for public sector, but also for private nonprofit. And so that's one example, tabletop exercises, of uh, roadmap exercises, um, private and public sector collaboration. Those are all things that are really good outcomes from some of the, some of the current research. The other thing I'll mention too is the cybersecurity certificate that we've we've been working with, and that is specifically for small governments, small local governments, school districts, tribes, uh, and uh, those entities that really can't afford uh, to have a robust staff. And that's a really important gap that I think that Portland State's trying to fill in this area because. Uh, in, in terms of raising awareness, but also really taking a risk approach so that in a 12-week time span, we open up possibly some of the opportunities uh, and then hand that off to some of the other entities, OSU, U of O, Portland State in some instances to continue that education and training. Uh, so, so those are the things that I think that, that we're able to contribute directly to to this to this community. Did I answer the question? You did. Great. Yeah. No. That's we great. Did good. All right. How are we on time? Do you have we, some time for questions? You want to take some? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. All right. So any questions from the audience? Yes. If you, if you could come into the microphone. Oh. There we go. All right, Re Representative Nathanson and I were uh, actually chatting this morning, so she asked me to, you know, come up and pose this question. And we'll say it's more about, you know, capability of the CCOE for the longer term. And and uh, Representative Nathanson mentioned about supporting the community, supporting, you know. The, the people of Oregon, and the thought really is around, we'll say, a 911 center for the general population um, that the CCOE could potentially support. I'd like your, your uh, thoughts on that. I think this one is for uh, the people who are managing the center. The idea is, okay, it, if, if you have a medical problem, you call 911. Hmm. Right? If you have a cybersecurity problem, you call it. who do you call? No one even knows who to call. So what do you think? Can the center figure out uh, a way that the public knows who to call? Yeah, one of, one of the things, um, so we, uh, I'm going to let Dave talk about Artsakh, the teaching hospital, and sort of provide, you know, we're, we're serving communities. Um, actually, this came up, um, you know, some of our own colleagues um, let us know when Curry County had the incident, hey, Curry County is, is suffered this incident, maybe you can reach out to them and, and help. And our reaction is, you know, um, for, for, these, for these kind of organizational issues, that's kind of a little late in the sense for us to step in because they're already kind of under a lot of pressure to get stuff, and that's when the the law enforcement agencies, F FBI and DHS, actually step into these situations. So there is, for, for organizations, there is, you know, some help. And, and we intend to sort of be there ahead of time, so to sort of reduce the chance of people getting into that situation. So that's one, one way to do it. Uh, then the other thing is um, the security problems are not just faced by organizations. And I think this is where the question is coming from. It's faced by, faced by individuals also, right? I mean, you're... 
um, identities could be compromised or you, you, you get um, compromised, then how, where do regular Argonians, you know, that are not a company to go? And I think it's a, it's a great idea. Um, and I, I think Representative Nathanson would know how much how much work and effort or in resources operating a 911 like center <laughs> happens. But we have some um, some things we could. So, for example, I know um, um, maybe Reza can speak to. I mean, I don't know everything that's going on. So Reza can maybe add on. Uh, OSU um, at least has an extension service center in every county um, in the state. Uh, so that, that gives us a, a, a point where maybe we could say, okay, if you get into something, maybe we could offer. And I, I have to be careful because our extension lead would be, would be mad at me for, for making more work for him without unfunded mandates, right? But I'm just, uh, I'm just sort of highlighting the opportunities available be, you know, to the center because of the universities. I do know that the Hatfield Center, they are also have a presence in every county, almost every county in the, in the state through their public policy work. So these are... These give us some infrastructure that we could leverage potentially to do this, uh, but this is a huge undertaking. Right. Yeah. Let me hijack this question to answer, sort of address a scenario that many of us need to call that 911 number. Every time we talk a cyber or think about the cybersecurity problem here, it is something from our perspective. You're running a company, you're running a network, you're running, you know. Uh, uh, campus and you're worried about attack and how you could be compromised, your organization could be compromised. There is a whole other new aspect of cybersecurity that has to do with the resilience of infrastructure. What happened if we have a Cascadian earthquake around here and I'm being told it is 100 years overdue? So um, if it happens, there is a high chance that our internet infrastructure cables are being snapped and the connectivity is being affected. And there are dependencies between in other infrastructures and the internet. We have a really cutting edge uh, alert system at the coast called Shake Alert, which is developed here at U of O. And Shake Alert gives you a warning when there is an earthquake, for an early warning. But Shake Alert system depends on internet connectivity. So if you don't have internet connectivity, good, good luck using Shake Alert. So it is really helpful and this is one of the goals, the longer term goals of the center, for us to do some resiliency analysis, some what if scenarios, that if certain things happen, are we prepared? What are the redundancies in the system to deal with it? So we can avoid so many 911 calls at the same time. How are we doing on time? Come on up. I guess I'm trying to understand what the role for the center is as compared to like CISA or the various ISACs. Like what, what distinguishes the center from all these other resources that some of us already have access to? F fantastic question. I'll take a shot and then uh, I'll see maybe um, Dave um, can take a shot at this too. I am a moderator, Bill. not a panelist. Yeah, so. I know, I know. <laughs> but he's, he's already taking a cop out. Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think, yeah, I, uh, ISACs actually, um, you know, 2015, when this idea was conceived, it was going to be an ISAC locally for local governments and stuff. And, you know, CISA has, you know, actually ramped up many of their services. So there is no point reinventing the wheel, right? Um, so we would be working with, you know, our local CISA representatives, and we know the, you know, Army, uh, the Oregon uh, Guard also has the fusion center. So we will, we, this is why we think it's, uh, uh, and I think Representative Nathanson mentioned it's about efficiency, right? We don't want to sort of recreate things, so we are going to work, identify gaps that they are not able to cover and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, things that we can cover. And um, some of the things that at least I might, be, I might have gaps in my knowledge that CISA does, uh, they do provide training. They do step in when there's an incident happens. They do also provide some monitoring services, I, I think. Um, but these are typically not sufficient in their, on their own to, to sort of improve the security posture of organizations. I think they all help towards that goal. Um, and I think, and that's where uh, CCOE and some of the direct services that we are providing coming in. The other advantage is 
uh, we, have a, we have a dual mandate. It's not just about providing services, but training our students in the process. And that's one of the benefits that we bring, I think, right, uh, from a center perspective. So we don't, we don't intend to duplicate stuff, uh, but we try to argument and sort of, you know, um, uh, take on things where, where it makes sense, where it's uh, the center's strength to, to, to act on those things. Can I add something very quickly? Uh, is is that I think a lot of these issues are interrelated, and and so have, being able to have a conversation in, within a center about the relationship, for example, between workforce education, new technology, uh, access for for governments or small entities to some of the workforce and some of the internships. Uh, so th those are just kind of quick examples, I think, of how some of the issues are very interrelated. Cybersecurity is a system, and so I think as a system it needs more of a coordinated approach. Uh, and, and so I think that's one of the key aspects of the OCCOE that, that really can contribute to the community as a whole. That's a great point to end on. We are over time and we're keeping people from their break. So let's have a round of applause for the panel. Dave is a hard moderator. <laughs>